It's time for Vax Talk. Let's talk VPDs. We're shaping the conversation about vaccines. To learn more, visit VaxTalk.org. Hello and welcome to Vax Talk. This is the podcast for people who do not take their medical cues from 1970s sitcoms. <laughs> what better source is there, Karen? The 1970s sitcoms. I mean, <clears throat> I'm not sure. I mean, maybe 1950s sitcoms. Yeah, uh, that's true. I, I, I think 1990s serial dramas would maybe be. Oh, yeah, like ER. <laughs> yeah. I loved that show. Sane Elsewhere. Well, that was 1980s. But oh, okay. it's, was it, wasn't it late? I don't know. Into the 90s, I feel like. Could be wrong. Yeah, I don't know. Anyhow, I'm Karen <laughs> Ernst. <laughs> I'm the executive director of Voices for Vaccines. And I'm Nathan Boonstra, a general pediatrician here in Des Moines, Iowa at Blank Children's Hospital. And we have a wonderful episode for you today. Uh, we're going to be talking about measles, eradication, and elimination. We have two amazing uh, medical epidemiologists from the CDC with us to talk about that. And uh, it's going to be a fascinating interview. Certainly everyone has something to learn from it. I'm really excited about this episode because it's a truly different topic than we usually cover. It's very hopeful. It's very, you know, exciting about the things that we can do through science if we all pitch in together. So it's good. Yeah, it's exciting. Before we do Around the Web, I just want to make a little uh, announcement, and that is that Voices for Vaccines has, uh, we have always had a newsletter for our members, but now we've added a weekly newsletter. It goes out on Fridays at 10 a.m. Central Time, and it's called This Week in Vaccine Hesitancy, where I just go through and I figure out what's the current thing that you know people are talking about as far as being worried about vaccines. Fabulous. Now they're doing weed whacking. That's all right, because, you know... Fighting off vaccine misinformation is much like weed whacking. So I think the allegory, it's really just enhances the allegory. To okay, have that I'm leaving it in, in then. The Leave it in. See, I just <laughs> saved you some editing time. Thank you. Such a good co-host. <laughs> Anyhow, if you, it all together. if you want to um, get that newsletter, uh, you just have to become a Voices for Vaccines member. And you go mm-hmm. to voicesforvaccines.org slash join hyphen us. You get that. You get that newsletter, right? I do, and I read it thoroughly. Yeah, Um, fabulous. Anyhow, let's do some around the web. Why don't you go first, Nathan? All right. Well, I'm going to bring up. You know, I have one around the web that I need to get to at some point, but then things things keep popping up uh, that are important to talk about. So I'm going to push off one around the web that has to do with pop culture. It's a little more timeless till maybe next time. But this time we got to talk about this, the most recent MMWR data, uh, that's been reported on the news that indicates that the percentage of young kids in the United States who have received no vaccine doses has continued to rise. Um, as according to reports published, uh, well, as of when you're listening, probably last week by the uh, CDC. So this is looking at kids that I believe between age of 19 to 35 months who have received zero vaccines by that age. This is truly the the vaccine resistant, the anti-vaccine segment of the population. And although number of vaccines are high and stable overall, the the the, the unvaccinated at this age has risen fairly steadily now over the years. It's interesting because for a while, it was, I felt like it was always stable at like 0.6, 0.7, I remember, in kind of yeah. the, the earlier half of, of this decade. But it has apparently risen to the most recent data for kids born in 2015 is 1.3% of kids with zero vaccines uh, from 19 to 35 months. Oh, that's uh, not and, good. Yeah, and that's risen from 2011. It was 09 but way back in 2001, it was only 0.3. So I don't know. I think maybe we should just pack it in. Are we done here? Like, <laughs> the, <laughs> War's over. I'm going to hang up my headset and my stethoscope and, I don't know, sell supplements. Clearly, there's a bigger market to, that I can maybe shake up some tinctures or something. Yeah, there you go. Start an online store. Or write a book. I think the writing's on the wall, Karen. 
Oh, no, not yet. I'm not giving up. For one, we have to eradicate measles. Oh, that's true. So it's, that's a noble cause. It's worth so what do you think about that? Well. What's what's going on? You got your pulse on the whole. You're, you're the This Week in Vaccine Resistance. Right. Honestly, I was a little surprised to see that the numbers had gone up because yeah. it felt to me as though they hadn't. Right. I do think that some of that isn't vaccine hesitancy or vaccine refusal, but the fact that um, insurance has gotten a little hmm. dice- dicier okay. recently. Yeah. And so people might be making decisions based on the fact that, you know, there's there's access, access issues. Yeah. There's access yeah. issues. But that certainly doesn't account for that much of it. So no, certainly there's so. there's more hesitancy. Um you know, I know there's um, more misinformation out there on the internet in general. I was watching a news report somewhere, and they were talking about how American bread misinformation is on the rise right now. Right. I'm wondering about that, too. And it's really sneaky. You know, our, my, my favorite example of that is David Avocado Wolf, mm-hmm. who, I you know, I see him cross my Facebook news feed about once a week because a very intelligent friend will be like, oh, I like this quote he has yeah, yeah, about, yeah. like, seeing the sunshine in people. I'm like, no, mm-hmm. don't do that because yeah. next week he'll tell you that vaccines are poison. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Never share that guy, people. <laughs> so uh, there's all sorts of that, that stuff out there and... You know, Dr. Offit always talks about how it's, you know, hard to unring those bells. Mm-hmm. Once people hear that scary thing, it, it's hard to bombard them with facts about it. So, you know, I, I think certainly our increased connectivity to a wider variety of ideas puts us at risk. So, you know, but I, I still was surprised to hear it because the pro-vaccine movement has really been growing. People have really been talking mm-hmm. with a lot more pride and a lot more volume about vaccinating their families. So I just, I, I don't know. I'm going to have to figure that out, though, because it's my <laughs> job to work on that. You know, I think there's a couple things to you. Like you mentioned, and I actually just looking at the MMWR, it even says um, coverage was lower for most vaccines among in uninsured children and those insured by Medicaid uh, compared with those having private health insurance. So there is a significant amount of access that's leading to that. Um, it does not say, at least I don't see initially here, how much of that this change is due to access issues, but that's significant and something that we uh, can continue to work on. I still wonder about, because when you look at actual immunization rates per vaccine, so MMR rates or something like that, those stay relatively stable. And what we tend to see is this clustering effect, right? So it's maybe not that vaccine rates are going down, but that there's a higher percentage of people who are going kind of full tilt and and in certain communities and whatnot, where there's these clusters of zero vaccinating people that may be not you know, bringing down rates of any specific vaccine significantly, but you're seeing this increase of fully unvaccinated kids, which is dangerous, still dangerous, but it doesn't necessarily measure overall public perception of immunizations across the country. So that's all going to have to remain to be seen, but we're going to keep, I guess you've talked me into staying. Okay. Right. We'll keep right. plugging away. Everyone Why? stay with us. Yep. The battle's worth fighting. Yep. Well, my around the web is uh, a little bit fun. No, it's not. It's it's terrifying and fun. It starts yeah. off terrifying, it ends fun. How is that? Sounds like a <laughs> roller coaster ride. <laughs> Take us on this journey. The uh, a, a while ago, I'm not sure when, uh, Jennifer Larson and Mark Blacksell made a visit uh, to or with Donald Trump. It, during this visit, Mark and Jennifer had their photo taken with Donald Trump. Mm-hmm. And they're each holding up a book in this photo. So this photo is on um, Ginger Taylor's Facebook page. Uh, it's a 
public photo and then they put something about it in on age of autism too there's a little post about it uh-huh. if you want to look that up i'm looking at it right now Go ahead. so they're holding <laughs> up these books and they look happy and excited about it uh-huh. and the books are completely blank they look like they're just holding up like their diaries or yes. something <laughs> <laughs> it's like a composition notebook and like a folder from a book report that they're turning into their That's teacher exactly what it looks like i mean it's the it's like such a sad trombone picture Mm -hmm. and um they were they were actually holding up denial which is mark blacksell's book about how you know nathan and i and most of you listening are in denial that vaccines are causing this right um air quotes autism epidemic and then the other book was jb hanley's how to end the autism epidemic which you know just shortcutting so you don't have to read it it's Mm. not vaccinating your kids or anyone two 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 luminaries in the scientific world really right i I, maybe the theory is if your kids die from polio they can't be autistic Mm -hmm. so um it appears that the white house photoshopped this picture So that they couldn't see what what uh what particular books were being held up. So yeah. <laughs> why don't <laughs> I don't know. I don't I just had to laugh about that because I, I love how in a lot of like in this age of autism, like they press on with this article with just f- ignoring the elephant in the room. Like going on about this and nobody mentions in this article that, oh, yeah, by the way, <laughs> like, they, they totally shopped out our books. And um, they go on as if it's not a big deal. But at least I don't think that they even mentioned it at the end. But I love it. So there's, oh, it does say it right there at the very end. Oh, it does say, now, interestingly, on Age of Autism, they do add a, as a blurb at the end. The book covers on this version are blotted out for a reason at Jen's request. We hope Don't. you will respect that. <laughs> no. I'm going to call nonsense on that in part no. because when this was posted on Facebook, mm-hmm. whoever posted it said, Oh, and I don't, you might know who this was, but it, was it Jennifer might Larson. be Jennifer Larson. And, and it says, Oh, now we know why this photo has taken so long to be sent to us as if she was surprised that they needed to do, you know, airbrushing on this yep. photo. So okay. I think, think that that might not be entirely honest but it would not surprise <laughs> me to be honest as funny as that is i mean it doesn't surprise me that the white house would that may absolutely just be policy that you know yeah. you're holding a product we're gonna we're not gonna we don't want to be caught off guard you know promoting something or associated with something that we didn't know what was in it so right. that doesn't surprise me too much Getting these books into POTUS, so this is Age of Autism, getting these books into POTUS's hand is progress. I don't think for one minute he will read them cover to cover. (laughs) Maybe someone around him will take a look through, open the pages, learn, think, and certainly must, and we certainly must applaud the effort, the very real effort of Mark and Jen to make this photo happen. (laughs) And this photo does not have the titles of the books in it. I love it. That's, uh, hmm. <laughs> I don't think he will read them. Yep, I, I, I concur. I agree. So. And, you know, I hope um, there are no anti-vaccine people listening to this particular part right here. Yeah. But if, for those of you who are pro-vaccine, this doesn't apply to anti-vaccine people. Okay. Let's say it that way. For those of you who are pro-vaccine, if you want a politician to pay attention to something you give them, make it a page or less. Books, <laughs> hundreds of pages of printed out materials, mm-hmm. not going to get looked at. Yep. One page or less. That's true. Photos on the pages, too. They literally call it, it a one page. So, yeah, they, they have too much faith in their books being page turners. Oh, man. All right. Well, that was fun. Yes, See, it that was, was fun. fun. It was less it was more fun, less scary. It was. It started off a little scary, but then like I said, ended fun. Yeah, Very fun. roller coaster. Yeah. So, um, we're gonna talk about measles uh eradication and elimination in just a minute. But before we do that, I just have a couple of questions for you, Nathan. Mm-hmm. Don't worry, it's not a quiz. Have you ever encountered in your practice a case of measles? I have not have not so do you have um a general idea or 
do you have faith in yourself that if a case of measles walked into your clinic, Mm -hmm. you would know what it is and be able to diagnose it? You know, I do, and I also know that the, I have some, partly because I pay attention to that a lot, but also because people are on the alert for it. So it's not necessarily, I think, an issue of whether or not we would know immediately on site that, that uh, or on seeing it that, that it's measles. But we all know that when you have a, a fever and a rash, then you keep that in your differential because and you do the things that you need to do to to decide whether or not it's measles because you could get confused the question is not whether you can immediately say hey is is this measles i know with 100 percent certainty this kid has measles the question is does this kid meet criteria that i need to test for measles sure and that we all know that makes a lot of sense you know it might have been in 1960 that a doctor would be like yeah it's measles but now it's a little bit you have to figure out and and keep it in there and and so I'm just, um, I'm hopeful that you're never going to see a case of measles. But I think it's important for people out there because I've heard a lot about how doctors uh, push vaccines, but then their own children are unvaccinated. Are, are your children vaccinated <laughs> yes, with the MMR vaccine? Yes. Okay. Mine too. Yep. <laughs> In fact, I have one child who has received either three or four doses of the MMR because his medical records were lost. So he's mm. like, he's like a measles supervillain or something. Uh, so he's fortunate he wasn't being bit by a spider at the exact same time because it mm. would really be some sort yeah, of... Yeah, that'd be something. All right. Well, let's uh, <laughs> go ahead and... Um, After the break, we're going to turn to our interview with Dr. Mark Papania and Dr. Manisha Patel from the CDC to talk about global measles eradication and um, domestic measles elimination. Do do I get to say my new catchphrase now? Yes, say your catchphrase. Roll that beautiful vaccine footage. This Vax Talk episode on measles is sponsored by the Task Force for Global Health in honor of Dr. Samuel Katz and Walter Orenstein, who played critical roles in eliminating measles from the United States. Dr. Katz's work in the 1950s made it possible to develop the measles vaccine that has saved millions of lives globally. Dr. Orenstein directed the U.S. National Immunization Program for 16 years during which time measles was eliminated from the United States. We are very grateful for their contributions and look forward to the day when measles will be eradicated from the entire world. We're joined now by Dr. Mark Papania and Dr. Manisha Patel. Um, Both of them work at the CDC as epidemiologists and work in the area of measles elimination and eradication. Dr. Papania works with uh, the Global Immunization Program at the CDC, and Dr. Uh, Patel works at with the domestic um, program at the CDC. And so I'm s- we're so fortunate to have them join us to talk about this really interesting, fascinating, and important topic. And I just want to ask, my first question is, is it okay if I call you Mark and Manisha? Yes, that would be fine, Karen. Okay. Same here. Okay, perfect. All right. Um, so, you know, Nathan's a doctor, so he, he knows a lot of these questions, but um, he might not know that I actually get the bulk of my parenting and medical advice from old episodes of The Brady Bunch, uh, which... I I think is just really fascinating. Uh, And there was one, (laughs) and there was one episode where all of the kids, uh, all of the Brady kids, despite there being a a widely available vaccine in the, you know, mid seventies come down with the measles. And it's, it's a funny, jolly romp. Uh, So why do we even vaccinate against measles at all? What's the big deal about measles? So measles is a it's a very common disease, and and basically, if you're not vaccinated, everybody will get it. So it was, you know, in in uh, decades ago, 
It was very common for every child to get measles in childhood. And um, most kids uh, get over it. It's, uh, it's uh, a nuisance and it's, uh, it's difficult. Um, uh, you know, you're sick and you feel really bad for a week or so, but, um, but you get over it. But the problem is that, uh, you know, even in the U.S., uh, one or two kids per thousand who get measles uh, can die from it. Um, so it, uh, it, it doesn't seem as serious as some other diseases because everybody tends to get it, um, but it actually kills a lot of people uh, because a small proportion of the people get it, die from it. Um, so that's, that's the main problem. It causes hospitalizations and complications. Um, most people get over it easily, but uh, it spreads very quickly and it does kill people. Well, that does seem like an important disease to prevent. So globally, if we didn't have, you know, just to kind of follow that train, mm -hmm. if we didn't have vaccinations, we would have um, over a million deaths a year globally. Um, back in the, you know, back before we had vaccines in the U.S., um, you know, we would have uh, an estimated four million kid, four million people would get uh, measles every year and about 500 would die. So it's a lot of cases and you can see that almost everybody gets better, but it's still a lot of deaths. So being that this is the most contagious disease or one of the most contagious diseases in the world, correct? Um, yes. What is, how is it possible to eradicate measles globally? Is that going to be a, a viable thing that we can do with the vaccine that we have? So the thing about measles is that it it uh, it doesn't have uh, it only exists in uh, in humans, um, and it only it can only it has to uh, spread from human to human. So it can only survive in uh, susceptible humans, and the infections typically only last a couple of weeks. So measles has to move very fast from susceptible humans to other susceptible humans, and that's what you know. That's kind of uh, it is one of the most infectious diseases and it spreads very fast, but that's also a weakness for uh, the virus that it requires a continuous supply of um, susceptible humans to be able to survive. That was going to be my question for Manisha too, is, you know, what's the big deal? Lots of people in the United States are getting vaccinated, so why do we still see measles outbreaks? And is there a good way for us to predict how and when and where a measles outbreak will occur in the United States? Sure. So, you know, like you said, that we, the U.S., um, has a really good vaccination program. In fact, over 90% of children are vaccinated against measles. And this is the crux of the reason why the U.S. is able to stay in elimination against measles. But like Mark was alluding to, there are importations that do occur, and this is mainly occurring from travelers that go to areas of the world that have measles, and that's not just countries like India. These are also countries like in, in Europe that are having measles outbreaks. In fact, two-thirds of U.S. residents of our sort of two-thirds of our measles cases are occurring in U.S. residents that travel to these areas. And so the, the key thing is really maintaining, uh, it's probably two parts. One is maintaining high vaccination coverage in the U.S., and that's everywhere in the U.S. And the second is making sure travelers are vaccinated before they actually go abroad. And I, one thing I do want to mention is that the travel recommendations for U.S. travelers that do go abroad is actually different than the routine vaccination. So we hear this all the time. Um, I'm mm -hmm. up to date. I got all my vaccines as a kid. But actually, there are some differences when you do travel abroad. And the main differences are in infants. So infants that are six months to 11, through 11 months of age should get their first dose before they travel. And the second is that adults, that are traveling should make sure they have two doses of MMR. Um, and the other part of your question is, well, why are outbreaks still occurring? Even though the U.S. has high vaccination coverage, there are still areas in the U.S. where we have pockets of unvaccinated groups. And so you need both. You need the susceptible people and you need introduction of measles 
for, for example, from a traveler. And that's where outbreaks can occur. And because of good population immunity, most outbreaks are limited in size in the U.S., so they don't really find people to uh, infect. But if an introduction does happen in a population where there's low rates of immunization, those outbreaks can occur, larger ones. So what kind of efforts can target those areas? How do we go about, and I know we can study and look and figure out uh, immunization rates uh, but uh, in certain areas, but what are the best strategies for getting to these clustered areas where immunization rates are low? How can we make a dent in that? Uh, that's a really good question, and I feel strongly that sort of anthropologic uh, methods to really understand why certain communities may not vaccinate. And in fact, some of these communities may just, they just don't know that they're supposed to get vaccinated. If they're in um, communities that they don't interact necessarily with, you know, sort of um, other communities in the U.S. or sort of uh, secluded um, uh, communities, they may not realize exactly what the vaccination uh, schedule should be. Um, and some, you know, others just uh, don't want to get vaccinated. And making sure providers are there to help answer those questions. And, and uh, we, you know, the domestic program really let is um, really we rely on our provider community to help educate folks that don't understand why they're getting the measles vaccine or may not understand what the, the safety issues around it may be. And it kind of makes me wonder, so if we're importing measles from other countries, and I know, uh, for example, in, what, was it 2010, there was a case of measles imported from Switzerland, correct? You're right. We have importations from everywhere. We can't say it's just one part of the world that we're getting all of our measles cases in. Karen, mm -hmm. can I just also make one comment about the safety note that I made? I want to just make sure your uh, listeners know that the MMR vaccine is a very safe and effective vaccine. We've been giving it for decades. And so uh, I just want to make that clear as well. No, I think that's really important because I think that drives a lot of what we see not only in the United States but globally why people aren't getting the MMR is concerns for safety and I, I, I don't think it's a coincidence that we're seeing outbreaks in places like Wales and France and you know other places in the UK given that the Lancet paper that Dr. Wakefield published is you know 20 years old um, so I'm wondering what besides that MMR that that false MMR autism theory what are some of the reasons globally people are not getting vaccinated against measles Manisha was saying that there are uh, you know there are basically two things that we really do uh, and that's true from the domestic side get you know get yourself vaccinated and especially get vaccinated there's special recommendations for travelers but this is the third thing is where the the global immunization division kind of chimes in and that's um, the U.S. does a lot to help other countries get people vaccinated because these importations are a risk for us. And the reasons that people don't get vaccinated in other parts of the world, um, there, are, you know, there's, there are layers and layers of reasons. The reasons are different in Europe than they are in uh, more uh, lesser developed countries, uh, lower income countries. In a lot of countries, um, the vaccine, the, the cost of the vaccine and the cost, uh, even more so, the cost of delivering any kind of health care to difficult to access rural areas is a major impediment to um, everyone getting vaccinated. The thing that's important to understand is that, um, you know, there, there are roughly a um, 130 million children born every year. So it's a daunting task uh, to get all of those children vaccinated uh, before they're exposed to measles. And that's, you know, that's essentially what we need to do. That's what we're trying to do. But we haven't really gotten, we've gotten uh, to the point where we're vaccinating roughly 85% of children in the uh, uh, in their first year of life when they're supposed to be vaccinated. And that's why we still have measles. 
That makes a lot of sense. What sorts of things have we been doing to, because 85% of the children worldwide being vaccinated against measles is incredible. So what, what have we been doing to sort of reach even that goal? There, you know, the, the vac- immunization immunization programs occur at a lot of layers, and it's really the you know the primary responsibility of of every country. Every country in the world is is vaccinating their children against measles. Uh, some do a better job of it than others in terms of getting higher coverage. And the 85% coverage kind of belies the fact that some countries uh, don't have 50% coverage, and that's where we have the most problems. The World Health Organization has uh, different regions um, that, and each region has a measles elimination goal, and the World Health Organization uh, works to help coordinate uh, the guidelines and strategies for vaccination. And CDC uh, works with the World Health, Health Organization and UNICEF and American Red Cross as part of the measles and rubella initiative, which is the now, this is an initiative that was kind of founded in uh, 2001 uh, with the vision of a world without measles and rubella. Um, and um, so we coordinate efforts. Um, the things that we do are assist in uh, conducting uh, immunization campaigns to kind of catch up kids that were missed by their um, by the routine immunization system. And uh, we try to help countries strengthen their immunization systems so that they can get uh, vaccines to kids on time. What, uh, what can a person here then in the United States who's listening to this who wants to help with global measles eradication efforts? What kind of things can they do? What, what resources are available to them to kind of pitch in and do their part? You know, the first thing is to, you know, as as, uh, Manisha was saying, is to make sure that you're vaccinated and you understand the benefits of vaccination. And, um, you know, one of the things, one of the difficulties that we're seeing is a lot of um, spillover of uh, disinformation about vaccines through social media. And a lot of that is coming, a lot of that is spreading from developed countries into uh, lower income countries. And um, so that's, that's a real disadvantage uh, to lower income countries. So educating yourself and your friends about the benefits of vaccines is first is the first thing. I think it's uh, in, uh, you know, not spreading this kind of disinformation, which can be uh, deadly to, uh, you know, children that don't get vaccinated in lower income countries are much more likely to die. I was mentioning earlier that um, in the U.S., the, the risk of death from measles is one or two per thousand. Um, in some par- parts of the world, it can be a uh, hundred or two hundred per thousand, uh, simply because they don't have access to health care. Um, they're malnourished, and uh, the measles can be uh, a killer disease in some of those some of those settings. So the other thing is, you know. Uh, contributing to the measles and rubella initiative, you can go to the website and see uh, what uh, what the measles and rubella initiative is doing. It only takes, uh, you know, including all of the uh, all of the delivery, uh, even out to many of the more difficult uh, places. Uh, it takes less than two dollars to vaccinate a child. Any donation can have a huge impact. One of the things that we've seen from uh, economic assessments of other parts of the world is that a, a dollar spent on a measles vaccine um, saves about fifty, uh, over fifty, about fifty-eight dollars in health care and other costs. So it's a, it's. Uh, it's a tremendous multiplier. It has a huge economic benefit. And so uh, by donating to WHO or UNICEF or the Measles and Rubella Initiative um, to help um, the measles uh, elimination uh, activities, it has a huge, uh, has a huge benefit. That is uh, actually really encouraging. It's, there's nothing better than feeling like you can play a powerful role in Uh, measles elimination and measles eradication. I was talking to Dr. Alan Hinman. Uh, I I think both of you know him, correct? Yes. He was talking about how he was involved in um, measles eradication, and he always imagined that measles would be eradicated in his lifetime. 
Well, he's a gentleman who is in his 80s now. And so I'm wondering, are we going to are we going to make the deadline? Are we going to see Dr. Hinman through or how how soon could we possibly if we all work together really hard see measles you know, kicked off the planet. So it's an interesting, it's an interesting way of looking at it. I also kind of look at it that way because um, another, you know, Dr. Hinman has done a tremendous amount on all vaccines, but especially on uh, on measles vaccination policies throughout the world. Another giant in the field is Dr. Sam Katz, um, who is one of the developers of the original measles vaccines, and he is in his 90s, and he's still saying, "I'm waiting." I want I want to see this disease gone before I die. So I can't guarantee that we're going to meet these deadlines for either. Uh, I'm I'm hoping that Dr. Katz and Dr. Hinman can ha- hang on a little while because it's uh, you know we're we are somewhat uh, you know we're making progress, but the progress is not as quick as we would like to see it. We don't have you know we we essentially have every. Uh, every World Health Organization region having a target of elimination by uh, 2020. So it sounds like it's coming pretty soon, uh, but we're not on track for that. Uh, we actually haven't set a global target yet. We don't really have uh, the global commitment to have a deadline for global eradication. Um, so I can't really predict it's not going to happen by 2020 when we have all our, all our um, all our elimination, our regional elimination goals, and we haven't really set a deadline. But it's going to be, uh, it's going to be years um, before we can get to that. Um, that before we can reach the goal of a world without measles. So, Manisha, we've been talking all about global eradication of measles, but when we look to the United States. You know, correct me if I mess up any facts here, but we had eliminated measles from the United States in the early 2000s-ish. Uh, and um, now, in recent years, we've been seeing upticks in, in uh, cases of measles that seem to keep increasing. And we call measles the canary in the coal mine, right, about these outbreaks. Are we looking at potentially seeing more and more of this? Do you think we're trending to more outbreaks? How are we going to get this uh, under control? Yeah, so it might be helpful first to provide some context on how the U.S. was was able to eliminate measles because it's actually not just, you know, we have a great vaccine and we implement it. There's actually a number of factors that happen. And the other thing to think about with measles is that it's, it's almost like two extremes. You have, on one hand, an incredibly infectious virus where one person with measles can transmit measles to 12 to 18 susceptible people. So one of the most infectious viruses that we know of. But on the flip side, we also have one of the most effective vaccines against um, a vaccine-preventable disease. And so the first thing is that with, with the introduction of the first dose of the measles vaccine in 1963, we really did a good job of reducing the number of uh, measles cases that were reported. Um, in one dose of MMR vaccine is 93% effective. However, in the late 1980s, there were still outbreaks going on in inner city schools. And so the, the next step was to introduce the second dose, which was introduced in 1989. And that vaccine really led kept to um, protecting those individuals that got one dose that may not have been protected initially from that one dose and, and protecting them. So, it's certainly the two-dose vaccination policy that was um, introduced in 1963 and then 1989 that really led to the rapid decline in the number of measles cases we were seeing. But there are other, still two other points that I think are important. And one is that there were a number of collaborative efforts with the Pan American Health Organization with reducing measles disease in the Americas. And that concerted effort at the same time where the U.S. was implementing their vaccination program in the 80s and 90s was also a major contributor contributor for reducing the importations that were coming in from the Americas. 
And then the third point that's really important as well is that the Vaccine for Children's program was introduced in the mid-1990s. And what this program is, is it's government funding for vaccination for children, which is critical for those that can't afford vaccines. And so there's, it's almost a multidimensional component to implementing a vaccination program that will be successful. So to your question, you're correct that we are seeing importations coming into the U.S., but it's also important to know that there's a lot of waxing and waning that happens. So certain years will be high, Disneyland, that was in 2015, 2016, that outbreak created a lot of disease in the U.S. and spread to other states. Uh, but there are other years that we don't have as many importations. So the answer to your question is, is we can't predict what will be happening in the U.S. But one thing we can say is that the better control we have with global measles burden, the less risk the U.S. will be toward, uh, uh, to having measles cases imported. Thank you. Um I just have one final question, and because I've got two people from the CDC on the call with us, and we're talking about measles, and the MMR vaccine gets a particularly bad rap for multiple reasons, certainly multiple undeserved reasons. A lot of people, I think, don't understand that the CDC isn't a, a big monolith that you are human beings who work at the CDC. What is your personal motivation to work towards eliminating and eradicating measles? Well, I'm a pediatrician with an infectious disease background. And honestly, my motivation started, my family's uh, from India. And my motivation started when I traveled to India when I was about 12 and saw kids lined with this infection. I, I had gotten some kind of febrile illness, and my parents were taking me to the, the clinic there when we were visiting uh, our home state. And there were just kids lined with this red rash. Just They didn't have money to be able to get the care that they needed. And it was just very confusing for me to understand, like, why... You know, they're in, they were here first. Why are we going forward with... Um, uh, getting care before these people. And so the sort of socioeconomic thing, seeing these kids really sick, really was my sort of drive from childhood to uh, working on vaccine-preventable diseases in children. And so um, I'm very proud to be a part of this effort, and I know we have a lot of work left to do, but I have also, uh, you know, talking to doc Drs. Hinman, we've really made a lot of progress as well. So it's very exciting. The main thing is, I love babies. You know, I just love, uh, I love to hold babies. I love to play with babies. And it really makes me sad to think about babies dying from things that we have tools to prevent. Um, as, you know, for, for my career, I'd like to have some impact. And um, measles is a disease that kills children. And we have a tool to prevent that. And we can not only individually protect each child, um, but we can actually get rid of the disease and then all children will be protected. I mean, it's kind of, it shares the benefit across the whole world. Every child in India and every child in the United States will be protected. I think kind of in follow-up to what Manisha was saying, it's important to understand the progress that we're making. India is currently conducting a measles and rubella campaign in which they're vaccinating a half a billion children. It's, uh, it's huge, and it's going to have a tremendous impact on the global situation. They're doing an extraordinary job. It's, it's being done. It started last year, and it won't finish till next year. But India is really committed to this. Um, also, China is, um, you know, these are two of the biggest population countries in the world. And China, um, this year, last year, had the lowest uh, numbers of measles cases ever. This is something they're really focusing on. So we need to get, you know, we need to get a global commitment to get rid of the disease. And that, uh, you know, that that's kind of the, the, the remaining piece of the puzzle that we need is a real global commitment uh, because we have the tool to get this job done. I want to thank both of you for joining us today and for sharing just really hopeful and wonderful news with us. Yeah, we appreciate the opportunity, Karen. It's nice yeah. to talk with you, Nathan.
Thank you for listening to Vax Talk. I'm Karen Ernst, and I am the Executive Director of Voices for Vaccines. You can find us at voicesforvaccines.org. And I'm Nathan Boonstra. I'm a general pediatrician at Blank Children's Hospital in Des Moines. Please connect with me online. I'm at Twitter at PedsGeekMD. I'm on Facebook and my blogs, PedsGeekMD.com. Stay well, everyone. Bye-bye. <laughs>